A great mix so far from West Ham to Vietnam. Lovely. Okay, doke. I think that's just about enough time. Everyone's got a decent number already logged in and ready to go. So hello and welcome to everyone from sunny-ish London. It was sunny earlier, but it's slightly overcast, but that's not going to dampen our spirits. We have, of course, today's launch of No Cold War Britain. My name's Sequoia D'Souza and I'm a political organiser and anti-war activist. I'll be co-chairing today alongside fellow anti-imperialist Susie Gilbert. Now, the format of today's event is pretty straightforward enough, involving a series of panel speaker contributions, which I'm sure you'll agree are from a, a great range of guests. Now we're due to run till around 8.30 p.m., give or take the verbosity of our speakers. Now, as mentioned, the Zoom chat is open, so please, if you haven't done so already, feel free to say hello, let us know where you're watching from and any affiliations and such like. This is, of course, just the beginning of the campaign, and we have many exciting plans. So please ensure you stay in touch with us via social media. And um, these will also be put into the chat, but just to quickly let you know, our Twitter handle is at NCW Britain, Facebook at No Cold War Britain, and Instagram at No Cold War underscore Britain. We'd also like to invite everyone to sign up to the No Cold War statement entitled, A New Cold War Against China is Against the Interests of Humanity. This is available on the website, nocoldwar.org, and is also being put into the chat. This will automatically sign you up to our mailing list to keep you up to date with our activities and future events. So I'd strongly recommend you doing so. Um, before introducing the first speaker, there are just a couple of points I'd like to make. Now, firstly, you might be wondering, why are we launching the new No Cold War Britain campaign? Now, internationally speaking, the US regime and its allies are continuing down a dangerous path of threats, escalation and aggression towards China, but not just China, also countries who seek to forge closer ties of cooperation with China. Now, this is important to understand because US imperialism is already, I would suggest, the biggest threat to world peace and the most distorting force on global affairs. Using a variety of methods such as threats, sanctions, coups, funding and arming various groups and via wars, and of course bombs, the US seeks to force its will onto the world. And in this context of a new Cold War, it will seek to further entrench these techniques of coercion. Now in terms of Britain, and this is something some of the speakers will go into in further detail, Johnson's right-wing regime is playing a game of shall we say, imperial fantasy land by sending an aircraft carrier to the Pacific region and seems happy to play junior partner to US geopolitical aggression, which is something anti-war and indeed any reasonable, per reasonable person should oppose. Now, it's also important to be alert to the rise in anti-China propaganda. There is a basic working principle within Western media that when it comes to a country which is designated an enemy state, there will be an avalanche of lies that follow. From the Gulf of Tonkin prior to the barbarism of the Vietnam War, the weapons of mass destruction prior to the decimation of Iraq, and through to the more comical example of Juan Guaido, who just declared himself president of Venezuela, and then the Western media <laughs> decided to recognize him. And of course, in the case of China, you will be asked to believe that they are a new and perilous threat that must be faced down. But of course, what they won't tell you is that the US has 800 bases at least in over 80 countries and is consistently at war. Whereas China has a grand total of one base and is at war with no one. Indeed, as the economist Yanis Varoufakis once put it, where China builds bridges, the USA bombs them. 
So we have to be vigilant to the lies, fear-mongering and propaganda as there are numerous negative consequences. Firstly, it lays the groundwork for Cold War, of course, potential hot war and worst case scenario, nuclear war. But it also, on a sort of day-to-day -day level, leads to a rise in racism and hate crimes, which we all, of course, deplore and must uh, oppose. Now, in summary, if we want to build a world based on international cooperation, peace and justice, we have a responsibility to join the campaign to oppose the drive towards a dangerous new Cold War and Brit Britain's participation in it. The greater our collective voice, the stronger our collective impact. Now, I'm just looking at the numbers of participants we've got so far, 161 from various places, as we saw, West Ham right through to Vietnam. So we can see already a strong sense of commitment and passion for this cause, which is very pleasing. Now, speaking of passion and commitment, our first speaker I'd like to introduce is Fiona Edwards, socialist, anti-imperialist, and an organizer of No Cold War. The floor is yours, Fiona. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction, Sequoia, and it's wonderful to see so many people here tonight. Um, this meeting comes at a very important time in international politics. Unfortunately, the Biden administration is continuing the US's Cold War against China uh, that was started by Donald Trump. And the British government is assuming its role as a junior partner to the US in this Cold War. Um, the stakes involved in this international struggle are gigantic. We must be clear that the US actions against China are aggressive, dangerous, and a genuine threat to world peace. We are multiple. We are facing multiple threats of hot wars, rising racism and economic damage. And all of these threats are against, against the interests of the overwhelming majority of humanity, including the Chinese people, the British people and people in the United States. Um, this is very clear on the economic front. The US trade war against China is designed to hold back China's economic development. but It has also proved to be an act of economic self-harm and made the people in the US poorer. Any country, including Britain, that follows Washington's Cold War approach will suffer economic damage, losing jobs, trade, and investment with China, and access to better technology like 5G. In this Cold War, uh, the most threatening dimension of all is the US military buildup against China. The US has 400 military bases that surround China. US warships regularly enter the South China Sea. And there is a real risk that this situation could escalate into military crashes or even a hot war involving two nuclear armed states. The US justifies this military activity by claiming that China is a threat. This is absurd. China has no chain of military bases surrounding the US. China does not send its warships to roam the California coast. So how does the US attempt to justify this aggression against China? Well, uh, lots of people on the call will know that the first casualty in war is always the truth. The US is telling lies about China on the scale of the lie that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. In the run-up to the US war in Iraq in 2003. We need to stand up to, for the truth and I think the truth will prevail. Everyone who stood up to the lies about Iraq or, or Vietnam in the run-up to those wars was proved correct. There is another very dangerous effect of this new Cold War we must address. The demonization of China is directly fueling a rapid increase in anti-Asian racism in the US, Britain and elsewhere. Cold War warriors in the US government and Western mainstream media are responsible for this. And we have seen uh, Chinese diaspora and other Asian communities stand up to this hatred and no Cold War campaign must stand firmly in solidarity with them and join forces in opposing this racism. For Britain to be joining in with this Cold War is a massive distraction from our real problems. As we speak, Britain is sending its largest ever aircraft carrier loaded with US fighter jets to the South China Sea. This is aggressive and a huge waste of resources. And it comes at a time when we should be focused on the real threats we face, defeating the pandemic, stopping climate catastrophe. The new Cold War is an obstacle to us addressing these vital issues. Um, today's launch of the No Cold War Britain campaign is part of an international movement that is beginning to emerge. We launched the No Cold War International campaign in July 2020. This first event of No Cold War received enormous publicity, including in China, with the report of the event receiving 100 million, yes, that's 100 million hits in the Chinese media. Last month, we organized an event in Brazil opposing the Cold War, which, which featured Brazil's former president, Dilma Rousseff. Progressive forces in Latin America want to pursue win-win relations with China. 
That's because China offers things like vaccines, trade, investment, and respect for sovereignty. And this is a welcome alternative to the US approach of dominating Latin America, including through coups and brutal sanctions. Um, we need to be prepared for a long campaign. This is gonna be a very long struggle. A no cold Awards approach is to build the broadest possible campaign. Uh, we welcome and work with people who have different views on China to oppose the Cold War. For example, figures like Jeffrey Sachs, a US academic and UN advisor, and others who strongly disagree with many of China's policies, but oppose the Cold War. Neither do we need to have everyone who opposing imperialism. This is about opposing the Cold War. Um, as a campaign, we do not take a position on China itself. We are against the Cold War. And we are for peace and global cooperation to solve the real problems, common problems facing humanity. When, within this, discussion and dialogue is very important in building opposition to the Cold War. And this has to include dialogue with China. It's, a very, it's very important we hear voices from a country of 1.4 billion people who are under attack from the US. I'm very much looking forward to hearing the different perspectives of all the excellent speakers we have tonight. I just want to extend my thanks for joining us. We really appreciate um, everyone who's joined the call tonight. In building this campaign, there will be very different views and analysis that everyone brings to the table, but we can unite around a simple and vital message. No Cold War, China is not our enemy. Thank you, Fiona. So thank you everyone for being here on this warm evening in London or England or Britain or wherever you are. Um, next up, we're super excited to have the amazing musician and activist Loki. Over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Firstly, as we know, the Chinese population equates to almost 20% of humanity in the world. There were at least four to five periods of human history in which it was identified by historians that China were the most advanced polity, and we are headed back to that state of play. Everyone knows that China invented gunpowder, but fewer know that the Chinese in 105 AD invented paper. It wasn't until the 700s, 751, that a war took place between the Abbasid army and Chinese in Kyrgyzstan, in which Chinese were taken as prisoners of war. And that ability to make paper then was transported through the rest of the world by the Abbasid uh, empire. Steel production in China was developed in the 200s AD. That is a millennium and a half before it landed in Europe. You had printing full pages taking place in China in the ninth century, movable type happening in the 11th century. You even have examples of those that claim you had the Pythagorean theory first recorded by Chinese scripts, ancient scripts. Just to uh, illustrate this difference between China and the rest of the world, if we look at Cheng Ho's mission uh, from China to Sri Lanka in 1405, he led 300 ships, had 27,000 sailors and 180 doctors. Now compare that to Columbus's voyage um, in 1492. He only took 90 people on three different ships. It was in 1430s that the Chinese banned oceanic voyage, thus disqualifying them from the European hydrarchy that would develop. And how was it that the West was won, quote unquote? As Samuel Huntington put it, of all people, the West won the world by its superiority in applying organized violence. From 1750 to 1900, Britain's share in, the world, uh, in world manufacturing went from 2% to 23%. Obviously, that had something to do with it occupying millions of miles of the planet. The US share of world manufacturing went from 0.1% to 24%. Now, what about places like China and India, who prior to 1750 had been uh, together over 50% of world manufacturing? Well, China dropped in that 150 year period from 33% to only 6%. And India dropped from 25% to only 2%. As the British said at the time, trade follows the flag and through um, uh, the building of empire, Britain was able to industrialize while simultaneously de-developing other countries. Of course, when Tony Blair handed back Hong Kong to the Chinese in 1997, he said to his counterpart that he only had a dim idea of what the history he was making up for was. Well, unfortunately, 
in Britain, we are not raised to understand how Britain became, this tiny place became the world's number one economy. Well, one of the ways is by forcing millions of people in China into addiction to heroin. At the time of the first opium war, which the process of it led to the British establishing themselves in Hong Kong, uh, the foreign minister, Palmerson of Britain said, this will form an epoch um, uh, of progress, of civilization of the human races. Well, millions of Chinese people being addicted to opium and being forced to take drugs was what happened. You also have the Taiping Rebellion in the 1850s, where Britain managed to not only fight against the Manchus Empire, but also against the rebels who also wanted to legislate against the opium trade, among other interesting things. Now, the British had a, a group called the Ever Victorious Army of Chinese, who not only had British weapons, but they also had British and, U and American officers with them. And overall, in that war, you had 20 million people die. So prior to World War I, this was the bloodiest conflict in recorded human history. So along with three opium wars, you had the British also taking part in a conflict in China in which 20 million people died. And it wasn't until 1917 that actually the British trade in opium in China was finally ended. And in fact, maybe they were fortunate they ended in 1930, uh, 1917. Will Durant found in 1930 that there were 7,000 opium shops in India owned by the British government. There's also evidence at the time that the British were selling opium through cafes in Iraq too. So this is consistent with a colonial foreign policy. During this period, the British also destroyed the Summer Palace in what Major Child, Charles Gordon called a vandal-like manner. They took thrones, gold ornaments, and you know where the contents of the Summer Palace is today? It's sitting in the British Museum. Within the lifetime of people still alive today as part of World War II campaign, the US bombed parts of China and Formosa that were occupied by the Japanese, killing 7,000 people, making over a quarter of a million people homeless, using 62,445,000 um, gallons, 62,445 gallons of napalm. Also within, uh, in 1999, of course, NATO bombed the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, in Bel Belgrade killing three Chinese reporters. So there is a memory of permanent war, really, against the Chinese and among them uh, regarding US and British foreign policy. Today, we're in a situation where not only does the US have 400 bases around China, the UK has military bases in five countries neighboring China. Um, however, this policy which they are pursuing is not going to pay off for several reasons. If you were one of these groups on Tufton Street who worked tirelessly for Brexit, you envisioned Britain coming out of it the other side being closer to the United States than they are to China. And at least in what they say, that seems to be the case. But this um, situation where Germany is no longer Britain's number one provider of exports has now left China being Britain's number one provider of exports. Even if it's countries like Brazil that the US were very close to under Trump with Bolsonaro, their largest trading partner is China. Even if it's India who the US may have hoped they could use against China, their largest trading partner is China. Australia too, despite the rhetoric that is in the press, their largest trading partner is also China. China is not isolated, whether it's through the Shanghai Five or the EU 16 plus one or the Belt and Road Initiative. Even if you look at the G7, the largest economies of the G7, the US, Japan, and Germany, the biggest trading partner of all three of them is China. You know, China has $1.1 trillion of US debt. There's about $2 billion of US debt being sold per day to China. So while this war is going on, you have the paradox of them being reliant on China for so many different vital and essential services. 
you know, the cancel culture um, grifters would never bring themselves to talk about the fact that Google deleted 2,500 YouTube channels for the crime of being tied to China, supposedly to quote unquote, weed out disinformation. But later on, YouTube, Google admitted clearly that the channels generally posted spammy, non-political content, but a small subset touched on politics. So what you're saying is 2,500 channels, the vast majority of which do not touch on politics, were deleted from YouTube simply for the fact that they had something to do with China. You know, you have 51 million Chinese people overseas with, you know, controlling an economy worth $700 billion. And that's almost twice the size of the Israeli economy. You have 396 Confucius Institutes in 87 countries. That outnumbers the 233 British councils in the world. Even when you look at drone technology, while the US and Israel are the first stop for those that want to spend a little bit less, their first stop is China. They've been developing drones since 2006, and the exports of drones um, from China have already gone to Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, the UAE. Um, and it is expected at some point that China will become the world's number one provider of drones, for example. Even if you look at what happened in 2014, when a US grand jury charged five Chinese people with cyber espionage against US corporations, at the very same time, Edward Snowden exposed the United States of doing worse on a mass scale. And moreover, the NSA's TAO was revealed to have what they called at the time, Operation Shot Giant, which aimed to hack servers and spy on Chinese government and companies. And as of 2009, the, NS, uh, the NSA were, were spying on um, Huawei with <laughs> one NSA doc putting it in this way. My apologies for the pronunciation. We currently have good access and so much data, we don't know what to do with it. Forgive me for interrupting, <laughs> just a heads up on time. Okay, I'll get no, to the last so point. Even if you look at the AI race, which is going on, um, you know, the Pentagon put out their third offset strategy in 2014, looking at uh, robotics and AI as being the way to deal with military disadvantages, as they put it. Even Eric Schmidt of Google put it this way, that Chinese AI development will catch up extremely quickly. So in a world where even Goldman Sachs is predicting that China will overtake the United States economically by 2027, where Britain will not only not be the world's fifth largest economy, it will not even be in the top 10 of the world's largest economies, where less than 29% of the British population can speak a language other than English. Britain and the United States have to prepare themselves for a world in which Anglo-Saxon dominance is no longer the norm, because Anglo-Saxon dominance has been the aberration of human history. Wonderfully detailed historical and political analysis there, Loki. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Jody Evans, the co-founder of Code Pink. For those of you, if you're not familiar with Code Pink, it's a women's led grassroots organization working to end US wars and militarism, and a lot more than that. But I'll allow Jody um, with her own words to give you insights. Over to you, Jody. Um, thank you for inviting me to this illustrious panel, and thank you Sequoia, Fiona, and Loki for your excellent introduction of the issues. And thanks to all of you for being here, for caring about peace and cooperation in a world of too many leaders gone mad on power while incapable of addressing anything real or essential. I am coming to you from the US, the belly of the beast, and the campaign we started over a year ago at Code Pink, China is not our enemy. I worry about the no Cold War message because like the Cold War with Russia, 
This is an aggression from the US on China. History and the media have continued to name things like wars that have been US aggressions on other countries and other peoples. The need by the allied powers to ensure Western imperialism is clearly in the words we see out of Biden's mouth at the G7 and NATO. This harkens back to the behaviors of those leading the US and Britain after World War II. This aggression on China sits on the really deep-seated racism of the low peril, the insane anti-communist passions, while it is tied to now the collapse of the West and the rise of populism. Recent polls show people are more frightened of the US. Um, it was the Alliance of Democracies Foundation. It conducted a poll of 50,000 people in 53 countries between February and April of this year that found 44% seeing the US as a threat to democracy in their countries, where China was 38 and Russia 28 which makes nonsense of the US efforts to be the rulers of the world as Biden continues to insist. We must remember that two A-bombs were dropped by the US on Japan and millions died in US aggressions on Korea, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. This aggression on China is not the same as the US-Soviet Cold War. And Chris Johnson may say he does not want a Cold War, but aggressions are already in play. Western powers have been building to oppress and aggress on China for a very long time. The CIA was in Tibet for 20 years before Nixon agreed to take them out. They've been working to destabilize Shenzhen for decades and funded operatives in Hong Kong. All of this can be seen as violating the communiques with China. And claiming ownership of the Indo-Pacific region, as Biden has done, is megalomania added to his already failing memory, which is beyond problematic. Adding to this insistence that China is violating some rules-based international order, whose rules? Western imperialism have broken the rules of decency, humanity, morality, and international law for centuries, and fervently in the last decades. The US strategic ambiguity around Taiwan for decades is no longer ambiguous. The US presence in the South China Sea can already be named an act of war, according to those communiques with China. It didn't feel like to the US when during the Bay of Pigs there were nuclear missiles so close. Yes, thank you, uh, Loki, for bringing that up. You know. Um, we are also destroying islands around China to put in missile bases, destroying islands and violating the human rights of the indigenous peoples who live there. Something that's also concerning is Europe's approval of Biden. Be careful. The Democratic Party just knows how to tell better stories and make easy gestures, but real systemic changes for the people, not. Biden and his crew are warmongers. They are operating from the Rumsfeld Memo on US hegemony of 1991. When it was released, it was laughed at by the New York Times, Washington Post, and Guardian, all the world media. It is now Biden and his team's blueprint. We can hear it in every speech. He and the US need to be at the head of the table, all while mouthing democracy. A country three million that is at everything, it's not voted into the power of the world. It bullies, steals, oppressions, sanctions, drones, and bombs its way to power, making all that democracy talk hypocrisy. In the US, the propaganda of the last year has been targeted effectively at the left and progressives. My arguments every day are with them, and they have swallowed the Kool-Aid. It is also funded by tax money to steal more money from taxpayers for more weapons and more. A Senate bill that was full of funding aggression on China through various agencies, including funding propaganda to denounce China's Belt and Road Initiative and funding AI at the failed Office of Homeland Security, while adding billions to an already bloated budget, went through like a knife through hot butter seeing only um, uh, one no vote on the side of the Democrats. 
That was Bernie Sanders. All while the streets of the United States are full of homeless, the world needs vaccines and cooperation with China on the global climate chaos we all face. So that bill has moved to a bill in Congress. It's called the Eagle Act ensuring American global leadership and engagement. The Eagle Act, again, spending billions on polluting the environment with military exercises, weapons, troop and ship buildups to maintain domination of the Indo-Pacific. This also with no opposition. All some members of Congress have offered is to pull off some of the worst parts. It too will go through like a knife through hot butter as there is no opposition to Biden for fear of what I am not sure. What we have learned in the last year is not to get caught up in their propaganda, but to pivot from their narratives to the one we can stand on every day. War is not the answer. The first casualties of war are truth and human rights. So if you are doing anything to promote war, you are stealing the future from the peoples of the world and driving more inequality. We need a big tent. As Fiona said earlier, we work always on building a big tent. And that's why we're, I'm here with No Cold War. That's why we're so grateful for what No Cold War is doing around the world. In the US, we also have been engaging with everyone who has a position of no war. Strange bedfellows always, but no matter the ideology or where, how they arrived at this position, everyone is invited into the tent of no war with China. We need a global call for peace like never before. A war between China and the US is unthinkable and building to it steals from everyone. We, all of us, need to be teachers like Loki. <laughs> we need to, um, you can find some teachings at codepink.org, but we need to be the debunkers, the teachers, and to those closest to us. Those are who is targeted with this propaganda. We can't let them be pulled in by the propaganda. We need to turn them into more teachers. You also need to be debunking the pro propaganda daily. Do just, not let journalists- Just to let you know, Jody, coming up to time, thank you. Yes, do not um, uh, let journalists get away with their lies. Call them out. Call them out in Twitter. Call them out in personal messages. Call them out for supporting more. If the conversation is not leading to global cooperations, leaders fulfilling the essential needs of their people, it is a fail. No need to get in the weeds of he said, she said that the propaganda is built to do. The message is clear. War is not the answer. China is not the enemy. We need a peace economy of giving, sharing, caring, thriving, resilient, renewable earth. You can find more at codepink.org slash China. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Jody. Next up, we have writer, poet, and broadcaster, Anna Chang. Thank you for being with us. Hi, can you hear me? Thank you. Um, well, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. It's not often that a Chinese Brit is allowed onto any platform. Um, tonight, I'd like to discuss the current buildup in hostility towards China in the context of the opium wars of the 19th century and the propaganda war leading us there once again. At the start of the first opium war in 1839, China was the most technologically advanced country in the world. Um, sorry, can you all see me? I'm not in the... <clears throat> yep. Okay, right. At the start of the first opium war in 1839, China was the most technologically advanced country in the world. It had already invented, as Loki pointed out, um, gunpowder in the ninth century, hydraulics, uh, ships rudders, the stirrup, paper, movable type printing, and much more. But it was their beautiful porcelain and silks, tea, lacquer, and furniture that drove the enthusiasm for chinoiserie in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. Because Britain had little to trade with China that they didn't already have, rough woolens and clockwork toys being top of the list on offer, Britain's treasury was being drained to satisfy the public's appetite for all things Chinese. 
Britain's solution to the trade imbalance was to grow mass produce, produced opium in stolen Bengal and sell that to China. Up until then, opium had been an expensive habit only used by the wealthiest Chinese. War being economics by other means, when the Chinese government objected to their country being flooded with narcotics, Britain forced these massive industrial quantities of opium onto them at gunpoint, turning an expensive aristocratic vice into a nationwide addiction. Chinese were slaughtered, their lands pillaged, the summer palace burnt to the ground by British and French soldiers as punishment for not being submissive enough. Uh, they were actually ordered to do that by Lord Elgin. If you think of the Elgin marbles in uh, the British Museum, he had quite a track record. Notoriously, Unfair, notoriously unfair treaties were used to carve up China, which was divided between Western imperial powers with Britain grabbing Hong Kong as a colony until it was finally returned in 1997. And around the same period, the invention of the Glass Wardian case enabled Robert Fortune to steal China's tea plants and transport them to India, where the British set up a rival tea industry in possibly the first case of industrial espionage intellectual property rights meaning very little to the invaders. Fast forward to the modern era, a couple of revolutions, two world wars, a vicious Korean war, and a rapprochement of sorts with the United States later. Today, China is the factory of the world, specializing in making our stuff. iPhones, electronic kit, solar panels, cotton, everything from foodstuffs to 5G are the new porcelain, silks, and tea of the 21st century. It's taken nearly 50 years into its modern era for China to drag itself out of the hellscape inflicted by the Western powers. It's raised 850 million human beings out of absolute poverty, created a growing middle class 550 million strong, that's almost twice the size of the US population, and it's established the Belt and Road Initiative that promises to do for poorer economies what China has done for its own. China's investing in Africa and building their infrastructure at much lower interest rates than the World Bank charges, so we no, long, we no longer need Bono to front drop the debt campaigns. As well as eradicating poverty while we implode, China is the world's biggest investor in renewable energy, vital in the fight against climate change. But some people in the West simply can't bear the idea of Chinese excelling or being given credit for anything. <clears throat> Just as the Chinese economy draws level with the US in this classic, at this classic Thucydides trap point, the declining superpower goes on the attack in a poisonous one-sided case for the prosecution with no judicially verifiable evidence or right of reply, involving a wall of hate and daily monstering of America's upcoming rival. America could have continued working together with China in a multipolar world, but instead throws huge resources at waging opium wars too, dragging in some of the worst perpetrators who gained from the 19th century imperialist atrocity. Billions are spent on character assassinating propaganda, economic war and actual weaponry to ensure the Chinese model doesn't give the public any big ideas that there might be a better system that's working for their own people. The absurdity that caps all of this for me is that the Brexiteers from Boris Johnson to Nigel Farage used the promise of yummy trade deals with China to persuade Brits to vote to leave the EU. And the minute Brexit's sewn up, we send a war fleet to China's backyard. Taking back control has meant handing control to a waning America that's tearing itself apart and doing their bidding even when it hurts us, such as ripping out billions of pounds worth of 5G infrastructure we badly need and spending our remaining treasure on whipping up a war with a nuclear power. And now we prostrate ourselves as America's airstrip one in the West's rewrite of history, we have always been at war with East Asia. We're now halfway through 2021. This conflict has been building for years. John Pilger even made a film in 2016 warning about the coming war on China. Trump fired the first salvo in his trade war shakedown in 2018, and we've sent warships. 
So instead of maintaining its own steady course, Britain nails itself to the USS Titanic and tries to sink our global lifeboat in what could end up as a horrific, horrific worldwide war. China is both scapegoat and a cynical diversion from Brexit chaos, an enfeebled economy and catastrophic COVID mishandling. With another opium war brewing, let's hope it's first time as tragedy, second time as farce. The sensible option would be not to go there at all. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Anna Chen. Again, wonderfully and richly detailed historical analysis and bang on time. <laughs> Um, next up, we have Martin Jakes, uh, academic and best-selling author who has written and spoken extensively on China. The floor's yours, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you so far for the very interesting contribution. Um, six minutes isn't long, so I just want to make three main points. Uh, the first is that uh, it's clear um, that Biden, at least on the question of the relationship with China, uh, is on a similar course uh, to Trump. And uh, there's very, so far, there's not much uh, difference in the approach. Uh, this is not surprising because uh, the rise of anti-China opinion in America has essentially been consensual uh, and bipartisan. So what we're witnessing, I suppose, is what uh, we've been uh, seeing uh, for quite a while so far. Uh, but he has one difference, one notable difference, at least and several differences, but one notable difference is that uh, Biden, unlike uh, uh, Trump, uh, is essentially anxious to reconstruct a multilateral relationship with uh, the, the other Western uh, nations uh, and seek, above all, uh, to make China as the central target in relationship to this. Now, I don't think uh, I, and Biden in some ways so far, you know, has been uh, introduced a new tone into the situation. Um, but of course, uh, his vulnerability is very clear. He could lose his majority in the next con congressional election, in which case uh, most of his economic program, a lot of it will go up in flames. And uh, lurking in the background, of course, of American politics is uh, what, happened at the, what happened with Trump and the situation where the country is deeply divided. So America is, you know, America has got deep problems, which I think we're all very uh, mindful of, but there's no harm in reminding ourselves of this. Um, when he went, I think that the, what I want to stress here is uh, the, the relative weakness of the United States uh, in relationship to China. I, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't see this anything like a rerun of the last Cold War. This is a very, very difficult, different situation. Um, and I, in a way, I think a, a classic illustration of this was the G7, um, because um, if you look at the communique that was adopted at the end, it's clear that what Biden wanted, in key respects, Biden did not get. And the reason he didn't get it was there's a con there's a, a an important number of European countries that see the situation very differently from the United States. Now, so when we get this talk of the Western Alliance and so on, then you, we need to uh, interrogate this because on the one hand, there's the United States. What's the United States' great concern? The United States' great concern is the rise of China as a he hegemonic alternative uh, to the United States. In other words, a threat to uh, uh, American primacy. And that is the central, central issue in my view, not just for Biden or Trump, but this is a consensual issue in the United States. Don't let go of our superior position in the world, our, our, power, our position of power. On the other hand, Europeans increasingly, with exceptions like the UK, are on a different track really. They, they have no, uh, hegemonic aspirations, they gave these up a long time ago. So what Europe is concerned about, above all, and this is much, um, best articulated by Angela Merkel, is a relationship, a cooperative relationship with China, which uh, in, in, increase, in the view of an increasing number of Europeans, is the key uh, to European growth uh, and prosperity. Now these two positions 
are very different. Um, and if you want to sort of extend this picture uh, more globally, um, then uh, if you look around the world, it's not just Europe, Europe that's making this calculation. It's many countries making this calculation. I mean, take American ally South Korea, for example. Uh, the, the, the South Korea does not want to be dragged into uh, an anti-China uh, platform or an anti-China uh, position. And of course, as uh, Loki said, uh, if you look around the world, um, then it's obvious that actually uh, China has a, a, well, a much bigger trading, trading uh, imprint across the world uh, than the United States. So the United States is actually not a very big trader, really. Uh, whereas China has a relationship with about 140 countries in the world count China as their biggest trading partner. So this leads me to my final point, which is that we're not seeing a rerun of the last Cold War. This is a much more complicated situation. I mean, the last Cold War was essentially uh, uh, marked by two uh, mutually exclusive blocs, um, profound military competition, and deep ideological schism. Now, I don't think this, this, this mood now and what America's up to can be characterized in the same way. Probably, I mean, we don't know yet, but I suspect that military competition will not occupy the same prominence as it did previously. What appears to be replacing this is a much wider range of, in, uh, of issue. Wider because China's challenge to the United States actually is a, uh, is a huge challenge uh, based on a very successful economy, very successful history, uh, as Anna, Anna was pointing out, and so on. So China represents uh, a totally different kind of challenge to the one that the Soviet Union uh, uh, represented. Uh, now, the result of this, I think, is that it's um, the other point I should add here is that China and the United States are both deeply integrated in the global economy. I mean, this just wasn't true of the Soviet Union. So in this case, uh, the United uh, it's impossible, I think, to try and excise or sever China from the global economy it would probably be easier to separate the United States actually from the global economy than it would China. So China is deeply integrated. So we're talking about a very different situation, it seems to me. Um, and I think the result of that will not be a real, probably one can never be sure about these things, but not a very clear uh, bifurcation of the world. But on the contrary, many countries will hedge, in my view. That's what Europe is doing. You know, it's getting on with the United States, but it wants to have a relationship with China, Italy, France, Germany, Greece, and so on. Likewise, if you look at, for example, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, where China actually is much more important economically than the United States, but no countries in Southeast Asia, uh, apart from Singapore, uh, perhaps uh, Vietnam is a, a different sort of example altogether, um, are, are, uh, are involved in a, any kind of uh, security relationship with China. So China is the economic leader uh, and shaper, and militarily, no, China hasn't gone down that road. So we, and this, this it seems to me, so, so basically you have a, a, situ, a situation of hedging in Southeast Asia as well, 700 million people, never forget that, bigger than Europe, and, uh, and extremely essential, it seems to me, to what's likely to happen uh, in the world. So therefore, the, 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 the situation where, or the situation we're now in, which I expect to go on for a long time, I, I think that the era from 1972 to uh, 2016 uh, of relative cooperation between the United States and China is well over. And I don't see that being resuscitated anytime soon. I think, you know, let's think, of 20 year horizon or something like this uh, uh, now. It's going to go on for a long time. But I think that uh, the, the, uh, the prospects as far as China concerned in this situation are very good. To finish with, I mean, never forget, America's the declining power and China is the rising power. Thank you.
Thank you, Martin. Um, and hi to everyone on YouTube and Facebook who are also watching us. There's a lot of people tonight, especially for such a warm evening. Next up, we have Li Zhengzheng, Chinese journalist and host of Talk It Out. Because it's uh, the middle of the night over there, she pre-recorded a video, so we will go ahead with that. Hello everybody, I'm Li Jingjing. It's my great honor to join this amazing lineup of speakers for the launch of No Code War Britain. As someone who used to study and live in Britain, I really cherished the hospitality, the kindness, and the friendship that people in Britain showed me. I remember my classmate invited me to her family's Christmas gathering so I wouldn't be alone in my apartment during the holiday season. I was amazed by their warm hospitality and really enjoyed how we talk about the cultural differences between our two countries and try to understand each other. I really hope more people from China and Britain will have this kind of opportunities to talk to each other. My professors taught me how to be a good journalist. Their words inspired me to continue this career that I've been doing for more than eight years. As someone who has lived both in China and Britain, I sincerely hope China and Britain can work together, understand each other, respect each other, and communicate with each other. Had they been born and raised here in China, me and my family have witnessed big changes. When I was a kid, even having a flush toilet in our own house was a luxury. Yet now we are able to live in relative comfort because my parents could improve our lives through their diligent work in a society full of opportunities. I was given the chance to pursue a better education, chase my dreams, improve my family's life, and be whoever I wanted to be. But my story doesn't compare with those I've heard from the people I've talked to in all corners of China. Here I want to share with you some of the stories I've heard from the people I've talked to on my journey. As a journalist, I try to travel across China and the world to understand different cultures and different people. In the past few years, I traveled extensively in Guangxi, Hainan, Tibet, Xinjiang, built precious friendship with people there, and also saw how their lives have changed over recent decades. In Hainan province, I saw how a place, a fishing village 40 years ago, has turned into a developed province, a pilot free trade zone, a paradise for tourism, a place that holds international forums. In Guangxi, one of the provinces with the most challenging geological conditions and diverse cultures in China, I saw kids from different ethnic groups in remote villages moved into brand new schools with top-level staff and educational materials thanks to poverty alleviation projects. With this level of education, the future generations will forever have the tools to stand on their own feet and make sure their families won't go back to poverty. In Tibet, the changes in the past 60 years has been dramatic. The illiteracy rate decreased from 95% in 1959 to 2.6% in 2020. The life expectancy of people there has risen from 35.5 in 1959 to over 70 nowadays. In Xinjiang, a place I've visited many times in the past 10 years, I was stunned by the depth and the variety of the beautiful cultures of different ethnic groups that have been living in that region for centuries, including Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Tajiks, Han, Mongols, and Sib. But I also saw during a certain period of time how people lived in fear because of terrorist random attacks targeting everyone across Xinjiang. People of all ethnic groups, regardless of their gender or age, were injured or killed in those attacks. Now there has been zero terrorist attacks in Xinjiang for over four years. 2.9 million people in Xinjiang were lifted out of poverty. Women, especially those who used to live in abusive relationships, who were told by their husbands or fathers that they should cover themselves up and not work at all, are now able to be career women if they want and choose the outfit they prefer. Me, a non-religious person and a woman, was invited by several spiritual leaders to visit mosques and temples of different religions in Xinjiang, in Mongolia and Tibet. The leaders of those faiths are not only opening up and welcoming non-religious people to visit and talk to them, they are also opening up to each other. An imam from Inna Mongolia told me he regularly meets the leaders from Buddhism, Taoism, and Christianity to discuss plans to build their city as well as organize charity work to help citizens. China has 56 ethnic groups, 5 main religions, over 80 different languages and dialects. And China has found a way to build a harmonious relationship among those people, promoting and protecting their respective cultures. 
I believe this kind of solidarity can transcend borders and can apply to people of all races, all nationalities. As a person who has lots of love for Britain, I feel sad to see some politicians and journalists there joining the narratives to demonize China, participating in the secessionism in Hong Kong like it's still their colony. The British media that I once looked up to is peddling this Western propaganda full of deep information about Xinjiang, Tibet and Hong Kong. These attempts aim to destroy the prosperity that we worked so hard to achieve, to bring back the chaos that we solved through poverty alleviation and shatter the solidarity we built. This is not the relationship we want to see between China and Britain. As a Chinese, I cannot forget the colonial past between China and Britain, but I think we can put down the differences in history, join hands, work together, talk to each other, and build a much better relationship between our two countries that can benefit us all. Thank you very much. Some very interesting insights there from Li Xingxing in that video. Um, and I think it's also worth mentioning, as Anna Chen pointed out, how rare it is to actually see someone in, in the West talking about China who are themselves Chinese. So that in itself is something quite radical. Um, next up, we have Kate Hudson, a stalwart of the British anti-war movement and general secretary of CND, um, which for those who may not be familiar is the campaign for nuclear disarmament. So over to you, Kate. Thanks very much indeed, Sequoia. And thanks on behalf of CND for organizing this meeting. We're very strong supporters of, supporters of No Cold War. And of course, the launch of No Cold War Britain is particularly timely as our government has this year made its hostile intentions towards China very clear. We've seen massive increases in military spending announced. We've seen uh, the aircraft carrier flotilla going off to the South China Sea. And we've also heard the government outlining Britain's ideological framework for dealing with China. And this very much piggybacks on the US narrative quotes to defend democracy against systemic competition, shaping a new open international order. So Britain's key strategic focus now lies in the Indo-Pacific region. It's described as a tilt, and basically it's building a network of regional allies against China. And in this, it very much mirrors the US Quad approach. This breaks with the UK's strategic position. And just five years ago, it was promoting closer relationships across the Asia Pacific, including not only India, but China too. So this, these new announcements from the government are a, a shift over the last year or two. And now this week, of course, we've seen NATO taking up very much the same narrative. And I don't suppose if any of us will be surprised about that, but it, it really clarifies the global situation and uh, makes it clear about the intensification of the hostile focus on China. And as usual, both with British government documents and now with the NATO documents, they pay lip service to the need to cooperate to deal with global challenges like climate change. But NATO ratchets up tensions so much in its statements, it's hard to see how that can actually work out. Um, and, and the NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg, he actually said, we don't want a Cold War with China, but simultaneously he unveils policies that will pretty much ensure that that takes place. Uh, what we saw from the communique that came out of Monday's summit was pretty much the same ideological framework as Biden and Johnson have already unveiled that quotes, China's stated ambitions and assertive behavior present systemic challenges to the rules-based international order. So they're all saying pretty much the same kind of things. Uh, the communique has uh, many accusations and criticisms to make about where China is going. And I'd like to take just a very quick look at what it has to say about China and nuclear weapons and to consider the double standards in the approach that NATO 
is taking. So basically, it makes two points. It says that China is rapidly expanding its nuclear arsenal with more warheads. And it says that China is opaque in implementing its military modernization and has a frequent lack of transparency. So just a couple of very quick comments about this. China has increased its nuclear warheads by around 10% to 350 warheads. Earlier this year, the British government announced a 40% increase in its nuclear warheads. So let me be clear, I oppose any increase in nuclear warheads by any country. And I also oppose the hypocrisy of NATO in this regard. Not only is Britain increasing its nuclear arsenal, but the other NATO nuclear powers, the US and France, are both modernizing their nuclear systems and spending vast amounts of money on them. And in fact, the US and Russia each have in the region of 6,000 nuclear warheads. So when it comes to the question then of China's transparency, which NATO has attacked, the UK also announced this year when it was announcing the warhead increase, it also said that it will end its own transparency about nuclear weapons. It will no longer publish the figures. So this is, these are the kind of double standards that we're seeing here. And NATO, of course, has also repeated its own commitment to nuclear weapons. They say, we reiterate our commitment to maintaining an appropriate mix of nuclear conventional and missile defense capabilities. And they say, as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. So it's fine for NATO to do all those things, presumably. The NATO communique also had a go at China for, uh, quotes, cooperating militarily with Russia, including through participation in Russian exercises in the Euro-Atlantic area. Now, this criticism, um, I mean, the double standards here are just breathtaking, because in March of this year, one of the largest NATO US Army-led military exercises in decades kicked off running until this month with 28,000 troops from 27 nations taking part. And these exercises are known as Defender Europe 2021, and they're taking place across a dozen countries. And the exercises span the Balkans and the Black Sea region, as well as North Africa. So really, that is the reality of what is going on in the world. And I think it, it's absolutely clear that the real threat to global peace comes from NATO. Without any doubt, it's led by the United States and it's continuing its expansionism globally. It's already absorbed most of Europe up to the Russian border. It's now active in Africa and Latin America as well as the Asia Pacific. So that is the reality of the balance of forces in the world militarily. Meanwhile, it continues to attempt to construct China as the enemy to justify its military advance in the pursuit of its own strategic and economic interests. So um, to conclude, let's work together to prevent this destabilizing drive towards war. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kate, so much. Next up, we have Andrew Murray from Stop the Wall, also former advisor to Jeremy Corbyn and uh, esteemed trade unionist. Thank you. Thank you very much and, and thanks for organising this uh, meeting that could hardly be a more important subject to uh, discuss right now. I mean, let me say I'm going to come at this perhaps in a, from a slightly different angle to the other speakers, all of whom uh, have made excellent contributions, which I agree with thoroughly. But I really want to look on how we can try and shift opinion uh, in Britain, and I think broadly the same arguments apply in the USA and elsewhere, against this drive to a new Cold War, which now, unfortunately, in Britain, as in the USA, has a sort of bipartisan impetus, and how we can develop arguments that will uh, that will shift the dial, as it were, uh, politically to stop this uh, stop this happening. 
I mean, we've had a lot of brilliant uh, presentations, you know, particularly by Loki and, and by Anna uh, on the history uh, of China. No one can say in Britain today history isn't important. We spend all our time now uh, arguing about uh, history and debating whether the British Empire was a good thing. Uh, spoiler alert, this has not been debated anywhere else in the world. It's only a debate you could have in Britain, uh, but that's all going on and getting an understanding of China's uh, civilizational history and also the depredations of British imperialism in relation to China, which in fact give China a far greater basis for resentment against Britain than the other way around, uh, uh, should the Chinese wish to be resentful, all that is important. And the political points are uh, important as well, taking on uh, uh, the demonology and asserting China's rights to manage its own internal affairs at the same time as it does not interfere in anyone else's. That too uh, is important. Uh, but there are, I think, big differences, and I agree with what Martin Jake said about this, between this Cold War and the last one. One is that China is not saying it is a model, its system is a model for the whole world. Anyone now looking at China can see it does some things a whole lot better than Boris Johnson's Britain. Uh, that's absolutely evident. Its achievements are tremendous, but unlike both the USA and the Soviet Union in the Cold War, both of which held themselves out as a model for humanity as a whole, China does not do that. And so I do not think we need to go into the trenches, as many of us did for the Soviet Union in the first Cold War, uh, to defend every dot and comma of everything the Chinese uh, government does. Secondly, the, um, the, 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 the argument against the, the original Cold War was that it might lead at any moment to a hot one. That was a specter that was very, very real. Uh, the idea that uh, that the USA and the Soviet Union could actually come to a, a war which would likely be a nuclear war uh, very, very easily. That prospect is more remote in relation to the relationship of uh, Britain and the USA, and I completely agree this Cold War is rooted in a desire or an impetus to try and preserve American hegemony uh, when the the basis for that has eroded substantially. Uh, but the idea of a military clash is less likely, which is not to say it's impossible. You can see things arising over Taiwan or elsewhere. Uh, but I think the argument has to be put on a slightly different frame. So I think we need to take as it were, a set of arguments out to the British public about why a Cold War with China damages their interests. Firstly, it damages them economically. China has become, in the course of this century, really, uh, a, a, an immense site of accumulation of capital. A lot of that has been invested uh, around the world on a breathtaking scale and without the accompanying interference in the internal affairs of countries where investments are made, that is, that is of interference that's associated with imperialism. Uh, and cutting ourselves off from that, denying ourselves the possibility of, of accessing that in a Britain that has cut ourselves semi adrift from Europe, hasn't got the free trade deal with America, to cut ourselves off from, the, from China, to, to get dragged into any sort of quasi boycotting uh, and not wanting Chinese uh, investment in the nuclear industry or anything else. Uh, that is profoundly self-defeating. It damages employment prospects. It damages the British economy. Secondly, financially, a Cold War is paid for in wasteful arms expenditure, this, this aircraft carrier cruising off to um, uh, 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 the, far, uh, the Far East. Cold Wars are used to stoke up military spending, and that is a huge diversion of resources from uh, things that can be spent much, much more usefully, uh, usefully on. And China, the Chinese spectre is being used with no remote security justification for a vast increase in defense uh, expenditure. Thirdly, and I mean, and, and this has been referred to as well, it will stimulate anti-Chinese and broader anti-Asian -Asi racism in Britain. It will damage community cohesion in much the same way that the war on terror uh, poisoned relations uh, with uh, the, the Muslim community and gave rise to an immense expansion of Islamophobia. It will damage our educational system because 
huge numbers of Chinese students are now studying uh, in British universities. It, it's a cash-strapped sector uh, as well uh, at the moment. Cutting ourselves off from that will damage the uh, education uh, system uh, as well. And then if we look at the big global problems, we cannot address climate change without close cooperation with China. That should be self-evident. It's also self-evident that we cannot meet global health challenges without close uh, a collaboration uh, uh, with China. They've shown they're much better at pandemic management uh, than Britain is. And there, there is likely to be more such crises in the future. So I think there's a whole, as it were, suite of arguments about how this course of confrontation, which is Britain again tailing along behind a US hegemon trying to preserve uh, its own uh, position in the world when, as I said, the economic and social basis for that is very substantially uh, eroded. This is damaging the interests of uh, the British people. So I think we need, in a way, to frame the arguments against this Cold War somewhat differently than we did against the arguments of the Cold War between capitalism and socialism in the 20th century. It's a different framing, a different uh, uh, environment. And I think if we can develop arguments around these points that we can take into you know, trade unions, community organizations, and into the Labour Party. It was one of my frustrations while uh, advising uh, Jeremy that taking China seriously, it was quite hard to get that done. It wasn't the main frustration. There's quite a, a long list of there. The bar is quite high, but it was, it was definitely, definitely an issue. And we need to make people in the Labour movement uh, and beyond wider progressive movements um, uh, understand that getting our attitude towards China right is essential for the interests of the British people. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. Some fascinating arguments and indeed counter arguments for us to bear in mind. Um, next up, we've got Vijay Prashad, Executive Director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. And I would also add, um, if people aren't familiar with his books, Washington Bullets is a brilliant book. So look that up. Over to you, Vijay. Thanks a lot, Sequoia. Um, congratulations on the launch of No Cold War Britain. I hope people, by the way, will go and sign the No Cold War statement at nocoldwar.org. Britain. Well, what are we to even say about this Britain? Britain has refused to come to terms with its colonial heritage. The English East India Company seized Bengal, where I was born, in 1757 by force. Then the British forced the peasantry to hand over their produce and engineered a famine in 1770 that killed a third of the population. So many famines. I mean, there were 24 famines between 1850 and 1899, tens of millions of people killed. From 1765 to 1938, Britain extracted 32 trillion pounds sterling from India. That was the down payment for the Industrial Revolution. In 1943, Winston Churchill diverted food from Bengal, my Bengal, to British troops, a diversion that killed at least 3 million Indians. That's another Holocaust, a forgotten Holocaust. When Britain was thrown out of India in 1947, the literary, literacy rate in India was 14%. So much for the gift of civilization. We were left poor and illiterate, and we were denied basic democratic rights. When Britain talks about human rights and its values of freedom and so on, all I hear is the cry of the hundreds of people massacred in cold blood at Jallianwala Bagh in Amritsar in 1919. Not for this or for any other massacre or engineered famine has Britain apologized. And if you live in Britain, I highly recommend you get involved with the Indian Workers Association and its Jallianwala Bagh Massacre Campaign Committee. Over the course of the past 50 years, the British have denied their colonial crimes, including by destroying thousands of files on a range of issues, including the bloody war inflicted on Kenya in the 1950s. The government hides, by the way, 1.2 million files in Hanslow Park, north of London, files which contain Britain's role in the slave trade, in the Boer War, and in the decolonization process. In the margins of a document on the UK's forced labor in Kenya, 
a colonial official wrote it must on no account be published it must on no account be published because britain cannot be seen as having conducted a forced labor regime in kenya forced labor is what other people do not the british Britain refuses to come to terms with its colonial heritage because to do so would be to cast light on this language of human rights and freedom and liberty. What liberty? From 1841 to 1997, Britain ruled Hong Kong with an iron fist. Where was the talk of democracy then? In 1842, a British official wrote, the poor Chinese must submit to be poisoned by opium or must be massacred by the thousands for supporting their own laws in their own land. All this must be forgotten. By the way, that's a British official writing that, not a Chinese official. Now, having refused to acknowledge its colonial past, it continues to do that, as, as Andy said, continues to refuse to acknowledge its colonial past, which includes these brutal wars in Kenya and Malaya and so on. The British send a warship, actually it's a carrier group, into the South China Sea. And my God, that ship, the aircraft carrier is named Queen Elizabeth, no less. It's a British warship that's in the South China Sea. It's not a Chinese warship in the English Channel. It's a British warship, let me repeat, in the South China Sea. It's not a Chinese warship in the English Channel. Having denied its imperial past, the Britain, British then host a G7 meeting. Well, it was in Wales, so I'm not sure if Britain hosted anything. Um, the Welsh nationalists would, I think, sniff at this a little. At Carbis Bay, and their statement reiterated the four great lies of the US-driven information war. Lie number one, that China created the coronavirus. I mean, look, we're back to this lab leak, th lab leak theory. Good God, I mean, it's been discredited by everybody back on the table in the Carbis Bay statement. Number two, that China threatens its neighbors. It's Western warships that conduct what they call freedom of navigation uh, missions, you know, inside Chinese territorial waters. It's Western warships that are threatening China and they say China threatens its neighbors. Interesting point of view, really. China suppresses democracy. I've already gone into the business of Hong Kong. Um, who suppresses democracy and what right do you have to lecture us about democracy? I mean, come on, first come to terms with your own past before you lecture us about democracy. It's a bit rum to hear Boris Johnson of all people talk about the rules based international order. First, uh, attend to the rules of your own wallpapering of number 10 in Downing Street. You know, you and Boris, uh, but Mr. Netanyahu personally corrupt people. Don't lecture us about what we should know about rules based this or that. Number four, that China cheats in trade. China cheats in trade. China has leapfrogged over the Western companies in 5G, in robotics, and so on. You can't compete with them on tech, so you have to now say they're cheating. This is classic, guys. Go and read the World Trade Organization's own findings uh, on the question of China cheating. Read the WTO. You set the WTO. Now get hoisted on your own petard. Don't have to read me. Read the WTO. NATO's Secretary General said something really very interesting. He said that China is coming closer to us. China is coming closer to us. Suddenly there's fear among the ranks of NATO. China is coming closer to us. What does this even mean? Does Jen Stoltenberg want to keep China far away at arm's length? Is that he doesn't want China close? There's something absurd about the rhetoric of the Western powers. And I want to put it like that. I'm not taking them as seriously as I perhaps should because there is a level of absurdity their new Cold War has taken on a white hot intensity. It's now clear that there is widespread agreement in these Western powers that China's development must be stopped at all costs, even if it means to mobilize half truths and lies in a ghastly information war that has no limits. They will use scorched earth tactics, friends, including racism of the worst kind, a combination of yellow peril, anti-Chinese rhetoric, and a combination of anti-communism. They put these two things together. They will use half-truth, scorched earth tactics, including racism, on the table to smash us into believing their ridiculous notion that Chinese advance must be stopped. The Global South understands when a country advances, they want to put their foot back on our necks and tell us to go back to our place. We are not permitted to come to the front of the table. It's okay for China 
to labor for Western corporations, but it's not okay for Chinese corporations to sell products to the world. It's okay for us to be coolies. We are forever the coolies. And that's what this Cold War is about. This Cold War is about the fact that we no longer want to live as coolies on the planet Earth. We no longer want to live as coolies on the planet Earth because we don't believe that anybody should be a coolie. We don't believe that anybody should be a coolie. Thanks a lot. Wow, go VJ, go. <laughs> Somebody was writing wallpaper, VJ, wallpaper. <laughs> Thank you. And our final speaker, uh, I would not want to go after VJ. Uh, ben Chaco, thank you so much for being here, editor of the Morning Star and our great partner for this event. Thanks uh, so much, Susie. And um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't uh, relish taking this spot after VJ. What a, what a powerful speech that was. But um, I think it's been a brilliant launch event for the No Cold War Britain campaign. And I hope that this sets the tone, showing the enormous range of arguments that we have proving that a new Cold War between China, the US, Britain, perhaps the whole of the West is a really dangerous development. And I, as maybe as a newspaper editor, want to focus a little bit on that uh, narrative as to whose fault this new Cold War is, because we might agree that it's a bad idea, but if you read mainstream papers or watch the BBC, you'll get the impression that deteriorating relations with China are China's fault. Um, so we hear that China is becoming more authoritarian. China is becoming more aggressive. China is responsible, as, as Vijay points out, for the coronavirus pandemic. Western politicians repeatedly hint that China has questions to answer over COVID's origins. Matt Hancock berates them for not closing their borders. That's a bit rich from Matt Hancock, who took 10 months last year before imposing even quarantine on foreign arrivals in this country after the pandemic began. Um, who we learned from Dominic Cummings today was regarded even by Boris Johnson as effing hopeless. Chinese scientists actually mapped and shared the COVID genome in record time. They were warning Western governments about the risks posed by this new virus in early January of last year, well over two months before governments in London and Washington bothered to act on the advice. An evidence-based approach would contrast China's effective containment, containment of the virus, which kept deaths below 5,000 and allowed widespread relaxation of restrictions after a few months, with Britain's death toll, which approaches 150,000, repeated half lockdowns, prolonged economic recession. But there is a huge propaganda drive to blame China for, on COVID. Trump called it an attack on the US worse than the World Trade Center. And last year, his claims that the virus might have escaped from a lab were widely mocked. But now that Joe Biden brings up those theories, you know, because it's Joe Biden, it's taken much more seriously. British and EU leaders hasten to say there might be something in it after all. And I appreciate the comments made by various speakers, such as Martin Jakes, in terms of the, the differences between Europe and, and the United States on, uh, on this question. But I do think there is a dangerous uh, coalescence around the US position that we, we're seeing at the moment. After the uh, clash at the Alaska summit between China and the United States, um, the US immediately got Canada, the EU and Britain almost to launch coordinated sanctions, targeted sanctions on certain Chinese officials all at the same time. Um, we saw the same thing after the G7 uh, just, uh, just the other day. In the, in the leader's speeches at the end of that summit, it wasn't just the United States that was targeting China, it was Italy, it was France, it was Britain as well. So there is a dangerous kind of push at the moment, which is um, possibly more dangerous than it was under Trump because Trump was regarded as a deeply divisive figure in Europe and Biden is much more widely admired. So they've resurrected this Wuhan leak. The scientists on the WHO mission, they've said that it was ridiculous. That's not Chinese scientists. That's Western scientists, you know, Dominic Dwyer, an Australian member of the original team, but there's no evidence to back up the lab escape theory. A British team member, Peter Dasak, says the new accusations are political, not scientific. So that China is falling victim to conspiracy theories on the Wuhan lab leak. So I think we do need to actually challenge all of this misinformation that is being put out because it keeps coming back and we don't need any evidence. So just keep repeating the same old allegations and it's an attempt to demonize um, China. There's a really dangerous consequences to this kind of 
um, this kind of propaganda war. It undermines scientific research into what actually uh, were the origins of the pandemic. Um, it's like the, the vaccine wars that we're seeing in, in that uh, respect, where for political reasons, countries try to discredit each other's vaccines and say that they're not reliable. And that, of course, just feeds vaccine skepticism in all countries and combats, you know, it, it weakens any attempt to combat the virus. Tomorrow uh, in Parliament, the top China DAP bashing Tory, uh, Tom Tugendhat, he's going to be talking about China's creeping capture of world institutions, such as the World Health Organization and various committees of the UN. The motivation is completely familiar. It's the hostility of the United States and its allies to any international body which they don't completely control. And BJ spoke so well about that with regard to the WTO. Most of these institutions were designed by the United States. They were designed by the US and its allies in order to impose Western rules on the rest of the world. And now that their control is slightly ebbing, we see that the United States wants to walk away from those institutions and start saying that they're not trustworthy anymore. When people talk about China breaching the rules of the international order, we should of course ask how closely do the US and Britain stick to the rules of the international order? Washington is a global pirate that seizes Iranian oil bound for Venezuela on the grounds that these two sovereign countries trading with each other is a breach of the United States' unilateral sanctions on both of them. Its record of starting wars, overthrowing elected governments and murdering civilians in drone attacks is unmatched by any other country. China is not being singled out because it breaches international law. It's something that Washington and London do all the time. The rules it threatens are economic and the G7 summit uh, mentioned those with its, uh, its uh, communique saying that it was essential to unite against any deviation from market-oriented policies worldwide. For too long, the rules of engagement and internationally and with regard to trade have been written by the West. Progress of corporate rights through the March of Trade Treaties, um, the imposition of US patents all over the world, something we're seeing the negative effects of now with this debate over, over vaccine patents, that's been on the march for decades in imposing the rights of corporations over nation states. China's state-led investment model enrages the US because of a lack of access to the Chinese market for global transnationals. They thought it was a cheap source of labor for Western firms. It's turning out to be something a lot more challenging. But its technological and infrastructure advances put the US's leadership at risk. Biden has warned senators that China will eat our lunch in his term, in his words, if the US doesn't catch up soon. And the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, which has uh, been mentioned by a couple of speakers, it threatens to expand that and reduce reliance on Western finance, the IMF, the World Bank, with their loans. Now, these are not uh, progressive or positive institutions. Western control of finance is very, very bad for the developing world. An Oxfam study last autumn found that even though the IMF has backed off a bit, from austerity economics when it's lecturing Western governments, it is still imposing them on the third world. 84% of all IMF COVID-19 related loans last year encourage and in some cases require poor countries hard hit by economics, by the economic fallout from the pandemic to adopt more tough austerity measures in the aftermath of the health crisis. Um, the words of Oxfam. So many developing countries prefer to deal with China for obvious reasons, yet yeah, that's always portrayed as a sinister exercise in buying influence. There's a drive to present China as becoming more authoritarian and more aggressive. Now, there's been some comments in the chat. Um, I don't think there's going to be time tonight to, to address those in detail on um, some of the atrocity stories that we're hearing about China. What I would um, definitely echo Andrew Murray in saying unity against the new Cold War does not require any endorsement of Chinese policies in any particular area. But we should be well aware that our politicians lie, our media lies, they lie all the time. They've got a long record of painting today's priority enemy as an existential threat in order to justify Western aggression. It happened with Yugoslavia, it happened with Iraq, it happened with Libya, it happened with Syria, and they are telling lies at the moment about what's happening in uh, parts of China. So the Morning Star, uh, which I edit, and the other, other, some other websites, including the, the Grey Zone, have challenged Western narratives about what's happening in these areas. I hope you do check out those websites in terms of challenging some of the stories that are being told about places like Hong Kong and Xinjiang, and some of the way in which Chinese voices are not um, raised. Again, something that's been mentioned in this meeting. Very few people reading the British media will be aware that the biggest trade union federation in Hong Kong, Hong Kong Federation of Trade Unions, it's called, um, never appear in our media. You never hear from uh, trade unionists from that uh, 
that federation because it, its evidence would contradict the British propaganda line. Now, on an optimistic note, we do have an Just appetite for a different I'm approach. Sorry to interrupt. That, uh, this is, the, uh, this is uh, the final point. Thanks, Susie. Um, we do have an appetite for a different approach in Britain. We did see that in recent years with the Corbyn movement. We did see in the 2017 election when he challenged British, Britain's long history of aggressive foreign policy, that there is a huge public appetite for something completely different. There are no winners in a confrontation with China. And polls earlier this year showed that a majority of British people do not think our country should take sides if there's a conflict between the United States and China. So we've heard how much tonight we've got to lose from this new Cold War. And we know that there is an audience out there. I would say that there is an imperative on all of us here today to go out and to, to, to work through trade unions, to work through the whole of the institutional left to challenge the new Cold War in China, because it is putting down roots in every part of the labor movement. It is trying to um, reinforce a rollback of the progressive policies we saw in the Labour Party and the development of an anti-imperialist foreign policy in the Labour Party that we saw in recent years. So it actually has uh, implications well beyond the Cold War itself. I'm sorry for, for exceeding my time, but brilliant uh, launch meeting tonight. Really, really enjoyed every contribution and thank you for attending. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much to all these extraordinary speakers for making this launch event so special. There's been great chat, really vibrant chat and discussion here on Zoom. And there's also a bunch of people watching on YouTube and Facebook. Um, thank you so much to the organizers, Daniel in particular. Um, this meeting is just one arm of an international campaign. We had an event with the former president of Brazil the other day. There are going to be, you know, all sorts of international chapters. Um, please do follow the website, sign the statement, follow on social media, send us any questions or ways you'd like to engage on social media, because we do want to follow up with you all. You've all shared like brilliant links and all the rest. Um, and yeah, just a huge, huge thanks. I mean, we could have listened to each of you for much longer. Sorry, we've been tight on time, um, but we'll be posting all the clips. Please do share all the clips. Um, and it's been amazing. A big, big thank you. And feel free to turn on your mics, everyone, and just say hi and bye and whatever. I know Vijay always encourages us to do that. <laughs> bye. Bye, thanks very much. Thank you. I thank you for including us. Get engaged. Yep, enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Okay, take care of yourselves. Don't forget, no cold war Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, everyone, and all the speakers. And just remember, this is just the beginning. So make sure you get a statement and follow no cold war.